welcome everyone. Um, I think it's very impressive how this little Danny, this little boy, tells us so easily how we can save the world. He tells us what we should do less. But I think it, that is a really important question, but even more important is what can we do more? And uh, this question is, I guess, the key question for tonight. What can we do more to save the world? So, my name is Norgie Thijssen. I'm the director of the Scientific Bureau of the Green Party from the Netherlands, GroenLinks, for the Dutch people here. And uh, on the day-to-day -day, uh, base, we are trying to save the world too, or at least we try to contribute. <laughs> Our organization is really small, but we are a political uh, think tank, and what we try to do is to, yeah, to develop alternatives for this system this capitalistic system we are facing every day. This system depletes the people and it depletes the planet. So we should have a big change. And one of our main sources of inspiration is Jason Hickel. He's the reason why I'm here and I think why you are here. So he's a big inspiration uh, for our work and his fantastic book, uh, Less is More, uh, tells us that, one, we need to say goodbye to the dogma of endless economic growth. But that's only one part of his message. The other part of his message is that it can be different. And, um, yeah, I think he will tell us how we can do that. Um, but for us, it was a really important reason to bring him to the Netherlands. And um, we are doing this together with the Commons Network, uh, Winne van Woerden, she is working for the Commons Network and she is one of the experts in the Netherlands on degrowth, right? <laughs> it's always easier when someone else <laughs> introduces you. So, uh, Winne van Woerden, she is the moderator uh, for today, so the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Norche. Is it working? I think so. Um, so, yeah, it's great to have you all here. Um, I guess it was sold out in about two weeks. <laughs> so that shows, I think, something uh, about the, the urge, the feeling in society for, 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 for an anti-capitalist story. Um, and so I would like to start, actually, uh, by asking you a question. Um, and after that, you can listen for the whole evening. Or actually, no, we're going to have some engagement. But um, could you please stand up? If you own a house. <laughs> oh, wow. Most people. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. Um. <laughs> could you, no, keep standing. Sorry, keep standing. Um, and could you, could you please stand up if you have a long term contract? So, a vast contract. No, keep standing. So the, those of the first who own the house can keep standing. <laughs> <laughs> and can you please stand up if you have a student loan? <laughs> keep standing, the first ones, as well. <laughs> <clears throat> Not everybody's standing, right? Could you now please sit down if you're worried about the future? <laughs> okay, those who are still standing up can sit down now as well. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, um, this was just to give you a feeling of, 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 of who's here today but also um, of, of to get your brains kind of turned on uh, about uh, on, on thinking what the economy is, right? And what our role in the economy is. Because we don't really do that on a daily basis, thinking about these huge questions of um, what the future of our economy could be like. Um, so, so today, um, we're going we're gonna to talk about this huge theme, um, post-capitalism. And... We're doing that because it's becoming all too clear that something is going wrong, that we're not heading towards the right direction. 
almost all of you were standing right now, or just minutes ago. So it's becoming all too clear that the foundations on which our society, um, on, on which human civilization as we know it today, are at the verge of collapse. Our planetary home is dying. And world leaders aren't doing nearly enough, doing nearly enough to do, to, uh, to do something about this. So thousands of people are already suffering today, um, already uh, forced to flee their homes due to the climate crisis. It's not something about the future. It's something that's happening today. But tonight, we're not going to talk um, we're, gonna not, we're not going to talk about the, 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 the crisis at hand. We're not going to talk about educating ourselves. Please do so, if you haven't done already. Tonight is about what fundamentally changing course could look like. So we'll do this by unraveling a discourse um, that for many of us, um, from, from, from the Wetenschap Bureau, but also for us as Commons Network, has been uh, highly inspirational um, to, to kind of grapple with this thought of how a, a radically different future could look like. And I am, um, I'm honored to, to do that with, with one of the most influential thinkers in this field, the field of degrowth today, that is with us, all the way from Barcelona. Um, before I'll start introducing uh, him to you, I'll just briefly walk you through the evening, because we have two hours, which is quite a long seat. Um, so just to, to, to tell you a bit about the structure, uh, we're first gonna, have, gonna, gonna hear from our speaker, um, and then after that there will be um, uh, quite some time for you to ask questions to him. Uh, so that will be about the first hour. And then we're gonna have a panel, uh, which is why these seats are here, um, uh, of three uh, experts people working in the Netherlands uh, on topics that relate to the, de to, to the degrowth uh, paradigm. Um, and then you can already uh, also in interact during this panel session. We have a Mentimeter for that. Uh, so get your phones ready if you, if you don't already. Um, but put them, out, put them off before that, I guess. <laughs> uh, I didn't say that yet. Um, and, um, and so after that, we'll, we'll close the evening uh, with a discussion um, with two politicians from the Greens, one um, uh, working at parliamentary level and one on municipal level. So two representatives of the Greens to really talk about the politics of this transition, right? It's not only policies, it's also the politics, the how of this transformation. Um, so, so we hope we have, a, have an interesting evening for you prepared in that way. Um, and you, you bear with me uh, during these two hours. Uh, so, a few house rules. Um, so, questions can be both in Dutch and in English. I'll do my best to translate, but don't feel bothered by, by speaking out in English. You can, you can do that in Dutch as well. Um, please formulate your question as concise as possible. If we have some academics in the room, I know that can be hard. Um, but um, yeah, so we have, we have about 600 people today, and we want to give everybody the floor, um, uh, give everybody um, the opportunity to, to speak up, also when, when people are not, as usual, uh, not as, as comfortable as, um, to do that. Please think ahead of what, what the question you are about to ask might invoke. Try to not be repetitive. Um, and be respectful towards the people here on stage. Don't be shy, be curious. So now, <laughs> he has been here in the Netherlands for two and a half days now. We've been exhausting him. <laughs> Yesterday, he already joined us for a strategy session at Commons Network with social movements, political think tanks, um, people from civil society to also strategize um, for degrowth, for a social ecological transformation. Um, this morning, he gave a special hearing in Parliament um, with uh, a, a, a huge, um, uh, across the political spectrum, um, MPs. Um, were there not only on the left, also on the right. So there was a queue of people waiting for, uh, of the audience. I think there was another room that needed to be booked so people could watch the live stream in that. Um, and after that, we had a heated discussion with national policymakers, people from the, uh, from the plan bureaus, from the planning agencies, 
um, over topics ranging from fiscal policy to foreign trade. So he's still standing <laughs> uh, and still being as bold as always. So he's professor at the Autonomous University of Barcelona. He's a visiting senior fellow, fellow at the London School of Economics, a chair professor of global justice and the environment at the University of Oslo. He serves on the Climate and Macroeconomics Roundtable of the National Academy of Sciences in the US, the statistic, statistical advisory panel for the UN Human Development Report, the advisory board of the Green New Deal for Europe, please read that if you haven't uh, already, the Harvard Lancet Commission on Reparations and Redistributive Justice, and the Lancet Commission on Sustainable Health. Please give him uh, a warm welcome, Professor Jason Hickel. Thank you all so much. It's really a real honor for me to be here. And thank you to my hosts for, for organizing my visits. Uh, I've really enjoyed my time in the Netherlands. And uh, I'm sad it's so short, but hopefully I will be back. Um, so uh, I didn't quite realize that this was going to be like a hip cultural event. Uh, I thought it was more like academic NGO style. And so, so uh, I prepared some sort of introductory remarks to the idea of, uh, of, of degrowth transition. But um, again, if I'd known uh, it was more kind of this style, it would have gone for some spicier eco-socialist material. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. Ho hopefully, this will be interesting to you. Um, I, think, I think it can be useful anyways to kind of set, to, to, uh, uh, kind of set the scene. So, um, right. So, uh, just to give you a brief overview of what I'm going to do, I'm going to start by grounding us in the reality of the ecological crisis, while specifically trying to highlight the colonial dimensions uh, of this crisis. So I'm going to argue that we need to understand it and our failure to address it uh, as an effect of the underlying structure of our economic system, which is capitalism. And then if we're going to have any chance of stopping ecological breakdown, and moreover, doing so in a way that is socially just, it's going to require that we liberate ourselves from the growth imperatives that bind us, and ultimately transition to a post-capitalist economy. Uh, so first, to the most prominent dimension of the ecological crisis, which is climate breakdown. We're presently at 1.2 degrees of global warming, and even at this level, the effects are clearly disastrous. Already, 30 million people are being displaced each year by climate breakdown, uh, triggering major social and political upheaval. For these people, as Vina men uh, mentions, climate apocalypse is not some abstract future possibility. It's happening right now. Uh, and we know that to stay under 1.5 degrees, as per the Paris Agreements, um, global emissions have to be cut in half by 2030, and that's the green line uh, in this graph declining dramatically from historical trends. But so far, government pledges are nowhere near this target. And most people are not aware of this fact, actually. But even if all countries uphold their existing pledges under the Paris Agreements, global emissions will not decline at all over the coming decade. And that reality is represented here by the blue line. Moreover, right now, existing government policies have us on track for 3.2 degrees of heating, uh, which is way over the limit. And this represents, I think we can all agree, a profound failure of our governments, uh, a failure of uh, our international system, and portends a very dangerous future, indeed. And crucially, climate is not the only crisis that we face. And this reality tends to fall out of our dominant media discourse, I think, a little bit, uh, but it's important. The global economy is presently overshooting several other planetary boundaries, including deforestation and habitats destruction, excess fertilizer use from industrial monoculture, water depletion due to industrial extraction, chemical pollution, and then perhaps most concerningly, species extinction, um, which right now is occurring about 1,000 times faster than the background rates, the normal background rate. Uh, and when the latest UN reports on biodiversity was published, the executive secretary summarized it by saying, and I quote, we are currently, in a systematic manner, exterminating all non-human living beings.
Although I don't know if uh, the word we here is very appropriate. Because, here, uh, uh, because here's the thing. People have a tendency to refer to this crisis in the language of the Anthropocene. And of course, this terminology is useful to highlight the fact that it's human activity that is dramatically reshaping our planet and our climate right now. Um, but this term is also incorrect. It's not humans as such that are causing this problem. Rather, it's being driven by the particular structure of the global economic system, again, capitalism. And indeed, scholars increasingly refer to the ecological crisis in terms such as the capitalism. Okay? Now, it's important to be clear uh, what we mean by capitalism here. When people think of capitalism, they often think of things like markets and trade and businesses. Uh, but markets and trade and businesses were around for thousands of years before capitalism and are innocent enough on their own. Right? Capitalism is only a 500-year-old system. What distinguishes it from other economic systems in human history is that it is organized around and dependent on ever-increasing levels of, uh, of production, right? constantly increasing production, which we measure in terms of GDP, and we euphemistically refer to this uh, with the magic word, growth. Okay? If the system doesn't grow, it literally crashes. It's deeply unstable and causes enormous social harm uh, when this occurs. Now, crucially, under capitalism, the purpose of increasing production is not to meet concrete human needs or to achieve innovation or social progress uh, or specific ecological goals, no. Rather, it is to extract and accumulate an ever-increasing quantity of profit. That is the overriding objective of production, right? And this process has no identifiable endpoints. And this is extraordinary. The dominant assumption in economics is that this should carry on indefinitely, that every industry, every sector, every national economy should continue to increase production, regardless of whether or not we actually need it to. Right? Now, this might not be a problem if growth was just plucked out of thin air. Uh, but unfortunately, this is not the case. The empirical record is very clear that the more the economy produces, the more resources it, it, uh, it uses. And this graph here shows global material use over the past half century. And this is metals, cement, forests, fossil fuels, fish, everything the economy extracts and uses each year. The red line shows what industrial ecologists say is the maximum sustainable boundary. That's 50 billion tons of materials per year. And as you can see, we shot past this threshold in the late 1990s. And as of today, we're using around 100 billion tons per year, uh, overshooting the maximum threshold by a factor of two. Uh, this, and this is the key driver of ecosystem damage and biodiversity loss. And material use, in turn, is being driven uh, by capital's pursuits of, of growth. There's a very tight coupling between GDP and material use. And for the past half century, economists have promised that more efficient technology and a shift to services um, would decouple growth from resource use. But this has not occurred. Uh, and it's a problem, uh, because again, uh, material use is the, is the major driver of ecosystem damage and, and biodiversity loss. Now, crucially, and this is super important, excess resource use in the world economy is being driven overwhelmingly by rich countries. And here we have the same data, it's a bit difficult to see here, the same data um, showing material use by country income group. We see that the rich countries, which are on the far right, use an average of about 28 material tons uh, tons of materials per person per year. That's four times over the maximum sustainable boundary. And by the way, it's also vastly in excess of what we know is required to uh, provision good lives for everyone. In the Netherlands, material use is even higher, by the way. It's one of the highest in the world. Um, now, why is it, tell me, that rich countries, which have such extremely high levels of production, such extremely high levels of resource use, um, at the same time still have large numbers of their own citizens who cannot make ends meet, can't access afford, uh, affordable health care or transit or even nutritious food. Uh, one million people in the Netherlands live in food insecurity. Right? Um, the reason is because under capitalism, decisions about what to produce how to use our productive capacities and our resources and our labor, and who benefits from the surplus that we generate, all of this is controlled by capital. <laughs> and of course, the, uh, for capital, the objective is to produce things that maximize their profits, things like advertising and SUVs and, and fossil fuels, rather than things like public health care and public transit and renewable energy and so on. And the result is that we have a system 
that simultaneously overuses resources and at the same time fails to meet uh, people's basic needs. Okay? Um, so meanwhile, by the way, lower income countries consume a very small quantity of materials um, and actually in most cases need to increase their use of materials in order to achieve uh, human development objectives. Okay? Um, now another thing we have to note here is that, uh, is that resource use in the world economy has clear colonial dimensions. And this is very important to me, and I'm going to try to explain it briefly. More than half of the excess material use in, uh, in rich nations um, is net appropriated from the global south. Okay? So here's the key facts. Growth in the global north relies on, on this massive net appropriation of resources and goods from the territories of the global south. And this happens because northern states and their firms seek to depress the prices of labor and resources in the global south in order to maximize their profits, okay? This is how capitalism works. Now, that what this means is, is that for every unit of labor and resources embodied in the goods that the south imports from the north, they then have to export many more times to pay for it, okay? Um, and what this, what this does is it generates a massive net flow of embodied labor and resources from the global south to the global north. Just to briefly give you a sense of the scale of this, um, in a single year, this is the most recent year of data we have, um, there was a net appropriation of 820 million hectares of embodied land, so land embodied in the production of goods, okay? Uh, to put this in perspective, that is twice the size of India. That amount of land could be used to provide nutritious food for four to six billion people. But instead, it is used to produce things like sugar for Coca-Cola and beef for McDonald's, consumed in the Global North to the benefit of Global North corporations. Okay. 21 exajoules of embodied energy is net appropriated from the South each year. That amount of energy would be enough to bring the entire population of the Global South up to a level of energy use sufficient to meet human needs at a high standard, universal health care, education, public transit, uh, heating, cooling, electricity, good housing, um, computing, mobile phones, etc. cetera. Um, but instead, it's used to fuel growth and accumulation in the global north. 188 per, uh, million person years of embodied labor is appropriated from the south each year. That's almost the size of Latin America's entire workforce. That labor could be used to staff hospitals and schools and produce food and goods for local needs, but instead, they work full-time, year after year, churning out tech gadgets and fast fashion for multinational uh, corporations. So this means that the South is deprived uh, of the real resources that are necessary to meet human needs. Okay? In fact, this drain from the Global South is worth about, uh, about 10.8 trillion US dollars per year, which would be enough to end global poverty 70 times over. But instead, this wealth is used to line the, uh, to line the pockets of, uh, of capital. But it also means, of course, that the social and ecological impacts of northern growth are offshored or externalized, is the word, to, glo to the global south. That's where the damage happens, right? Southern ecosystems and communities are being plundered to support uh, growthism in the north. So all of this is true when it comes to energy as well. GDP growth involves energy use. Uh, and here again, the inequalities are huge. High-income countries on the right, as you can see, use vastly more energy than would be required to provision good lives for everyone, which is represented by the black line, uh, and, and obviously vastly more energy than the rest of the world. And again, this energy uh, is being used to feed a production system that uh, is controlled by the 1% and geared around maximizing profit and elite accumulation, not around human well-being. Okay. And as a result of, of this, high-income countries also have very high levels of, uh, of emissions. In fact, we know that they are overwhelmingly responsible uh, for the vast majority of excess emissions that are presently driving climate breakdown. So in a recent analysis, my colleagues and I found that the USA alone is responsible for 40% of emissions in excess of the safe planetary boundary. So that's 40% of all of the damages caused by climate breakdown all around the world. The Global North as a group, which includes the USA, but also Canada, uh, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and Japan, is responsible for 92%. And that's the area represented here by the, by the dark green. Okay. 
Meanwhile, the entire continents of Africa and Asia and Latin America are responsible for only 8% of excess emissions, and that's the light green here. Um, and most of the countries in the global south, uh, including countries like India and Indonesia, are still within their fair share of, uh, of uh, the safe planetary boundary, okay? So we need to understand this reality as a process of atmospheric colonization. The atmosphere is a shared commons on which all of us depend for our existence. And the global north countries, and the rich in particular, have appropriated it for their own enrichments with devastating consequences for all of us uh, and for all of life on Earth. Meanwhile, the global south, which has done so little to cause uh, the problem, suffers 82 to 92% to of all of the costs of climate breakdown and 98 to 99% of all climate-related deaths. So virtually all climate-related mortality is suffered in the territories of the global south. It would be difficult, I think, to overstate the scale of the injustice that this represents. Okay, so what needs to happen? Well, clearly, uh, this problem will not be solved with just a few more solar panels and a few more electric cars and, and keep everything else the same. This is a systemic crisis and it requires systemic solutions. So let me try to explore this a little bit. First, we know that rich countries need to scale down their use of our planet's material resources by, by more than 50% from existing levels. Okay? Now, the existing discourse out there claims that this can be accomplished through green growth. And the idea here is uh, efficiency improvements will allow us to achieve an absolute decoupling of GDP um, so that GDP keeps rising indefinitely into the bright future. Uh, while material use uh, declines to sustainable levels. It sounds wonderful, but the problem is that scientists uh, question the empirical validity of this narrative, uh, and I think this is not seeped enough into, uh, into our public discourse. Yes, efficiency improvements are vitally important, but in a growth-oriented economy, the gains from efficiency improvements are reinvested to expand the process of production, right? And so it makes it very difficult to achieve absolute reductions in material use. So for example, if you are Coca-Cola and you find a way to produce aluminum cans with 10% less metal, no, this is an efficient, efficiency improvement. What do you do with the savings? Is you invest in an advertising campaign or expanding production into other, uh, into other regions and, uh, and into schools or whatever it might be. It's, and so you're increasing production in, uh, in total and that makes uh, most of the gains get wiped out. So the problem here is not our technology. Our technology is good. We should be proud of it. <laughs> the problem is growth. Um, and what this means is that if, if high-income nations are to achieve sufficient reductions in material use, then we need to abandon growth as an imperative. Um, in a post-growth scenario, efficiency improvements would in fact work as we expect them to and deliver reductions in, in material use. Okay? okay, so what about climate? Let's talk about this. Now remember, to stay under 1.5 degrees, we need to cut emissions to zero by 2050. We all agree. And high-income nations, uh, given their disproportionate share of historical responsibility, have an obligation under the Paris Agreement to decarbonize faster. And this is uh, the equity principle. Okay? Now, emissions are different from materials. We know it is possible to absolutely decouple GDP from emissions um, by transitioning simply to lower carbon energy sources. And indeed, more than a dozen high-income nations have already been on this path, uh, right? Uh, even when we measure emissions in consumption-based terms. Now, this fact has, widely, has been used widely, this, <laughs> this got a bit messed up, sorry, <laughs> has been used widely to argue that not only is green growth possible, but it's already here. And this is an article from the Financial Times a few, a few weeks ago. Okay. Uh, so you can see Denmark, Sweden, the UK. Oh, by the way, the Netherlands is also one of these decouplers, rising GDP with declining emissions at 1.4% de uh, decline per year. Okay. Now, what this discourse obscures is that none of these nations, including the Netherlands, <laughs> um, are, are reducing emissions in line with the Paris Agreement. Okay? Not even uh, the highest performing countries like Denmark and the UK, et cetera. Right? Uh, they're, they're way off. Uh, in the Netherlands, existing emissions reductions uh, on, on our existing trend, it will take 200 years to reach net zero. And we'll blow through our fair share. I'm saying our like I'm from the Netherlands. This is cool. We'll blow through our fair our fair share of the, of the carbon budget, seven times over, right? There's nothing green about this. 
These are all inadequate. So the question becomes, is it possible to achieve sufficiently rapid decarbonization? Right? Or do we just uh, become doomers and, and give up? No, it is possible. Um, but not if high-income nations continue to pursue growthism at the same time. And the reason is, again, because more growth requires more energy use than would otherwise be the case. And this makes rapid decarbonization more difficult to achieve. Okay? So uh, it makes our jobs harder, and why would we do that to ourselves? Um, proponents of green growth, by the way, just briefly, they understand this problem. Uh, and the way they tend to solve it is by, uh, is by gambling on the possibility of speculative negative emissions technologies. The idea is that in the future, the younger generation will devise ways to pull carbon back out of the atmosphere. And so we don't have to worry about stopping emissions now. We'll, just we'll emit over our temperature thresholds and then put it on the youth to sort of solve this problem in the future, right? Um, this, this has all sorts of problems that's, that scientists reject quite uh, vehemently. <laughs> Um, the main thing is uh, that if this strategy was to fail for any social or political or technological reason, uh, which is highly likely to do, then we will be locked into a hothouse trajectory from which it will be impossible for us to escape, right? So it's a massive gamble with the future of human civilization and all of life on Earth, all to defend continued economic growth in the global North, which is not even necessary. And I think we need to reckon with that. So in its latest report, the IPCC points out that scholarship on degrowth offers, uh, offers an alternative path. Now, degrowth research embraces efficiency improvements and embraces technological innovation, okay? But it recognizes that this alone will not be enough and therefore calls on rich nations to also abandon GDP growth as an objective in and of itself and scale down less necessary forms of production, okay? So what does this look like in practice? It's quite simple. <laughs> uh, instead of assuming that every sector of the economy must grow all the time, uh, regardless of whether or not we actually need it to, we should decide democratically what sectors we actually need to increase, things like renewable energy and public transit and access to affordable housing, right? And what sectors are clearly destructive and should be scaled down. Things like SUV production, private jets, uh, air travel, fast fashion, industrial beef, cruises, advertising, the widespread practice of planned obsolescence, the military industrial complex, right, and so on. There are clearly huge chunks of the economy that are organized uh, mostly around corporate profits and power and elite consumption, and we don't need them. Now, this approach is powerful in terms of climate mitigation because it would significantly reduce energy use and therefore uh, enable us to have a much faster transition to renewables, okay? Fast enough to stay under 1.5 degrees. Now, most people would regard this as, uh, as sensible, right? Except for one obvious sticking point. <laughs> what about jobs? What about livelihoods? As we scale down less necessary forms of economic activity, then won't that lead to unemployment? And if so, clearly this is politically untenable. Uh, and nobody would agree to such a future, and nobody should. Okay? Fortunately, ecological economists propose a simple solution. If the economy requires less labor to produce the things that we do need, then we can shorten the working week and share necessary labor more evenly. Right? thus preventing any un unemployment and taking any benefits in terms of increased leisure time, uh, which has strong positive benefits for, uh, for society. We can also roll out a climate job guarantee. This is an important one. A program like this would ensure that anyone who wants to can train to participate in the most important collective projects of our generation. Right? Building renewable energy capacity, insulating homes, producing local food, regenerating ecosystems. This permanently ends unemployment and allows us to mobilize labor around socially necessary objectives rather than around corporate profits, right? So it allows us to shift our productive capacities around things that we really do need, objectives we really want to achieve uh, um, in a short period of time. At the same time, we need to decommodify essential goods and expand universal public services. And here I mean not just the typical ones, like 
healthcare and education, but also universal affordable housing, public transits, clean energy, uh, right? Water, internet, nutritious food. Um, taking this approach ensures that essential goods are always going to be produced and everyone will have access to them regardless of, uh, of whether there are fluctuations in aggregate output, right? And right now, again, if you have a recession in the economy, people lose their access to these things because their access is mediated entirely by wages. And so decommodification becomes critically important here. On top of this, we need to dramatically reduce inequality and distribute income more fairly. And, and this is really key. Uh, um, people often ask me this interesting question. They say, will there be enough income in a degrowth scenario um, to meet human needs? And the answer to this is interesting. The answer is yes, but not just yes. By definition, yes. Okay? Um, because national income is simply by definition equal to the total prices of all of the stuff that is produced in the economy. Okay? Um, it's an accounting identity. There's always exactly enough income to buy everything the economy produces. So therefore, as long as we are producing what people need, there's always by definition enough income to buy those things, so long as the income is distributed fairly. Distribution is everything here, uh, right? So, so taking this approach, establishing a firm social guarantee and sharing resources more fairly would allow us to ensure decent livelihoods for all, delinking human well-being from economic growth. This ends the growth imperative. It breaks the political logjam around climate action. Right now, we cannot pursue radical climate action because it might have harmful effects on employment and livelihoods. But by taking the question of employment and livelihoods off the table, by permanently solving that question, right? We can pursue radical climate action without anyone getting hurt. This is the bread and butter of a just transition. We need to have policies like this. Um, now, I briefly also uh, want to emphasize that the demand for degrowth is not just about ecology. It's also an anti-colonial demand. Degrowth scholarship calls for an end to the colonial patterns of appropriation that underpin northern capital accumulation, to release the global south from the grip of extractivism and from a future of catastrophic climate breakdown. Southern countries should be free to organize their resources and their labor around meeting human needs rather than around servicing northern growthism. Degrowth, in other words, is an anti-colonial demand, a demand for decolonization. And this thinking is actually ref is reflected clearly today in the People's Agreements of Cochabamba, which was signed in 2010 by thousands of social movements from across the global south, and I urge you to read it if you have, if you have not done so yet. So we know empirically that with measures like these, we can achieve a rapid reduction in emissions, consistent with staying under 1.5 degrees, while at the same time reversing other forms of ecological breakdown. Global warming would stop. The land would regenerate. Biodiversity would bounce back. Our planets would heal. And best of all, we do this while improving social outcomes, right? Organizing our productive capacities around human needs and well-being and ecology rather than around capital accumulation. This is incredibly hopeful news. It's a powerful antidote, I think, to the depression and anxiety and doomerism that has seeped into our culture. But we have to be clear. This will not happen by itself, okay? It requires a significant shift in mentality. Uh, for decades, we've been told that if we care about the environments, we have to focus on individual behavior change. But this is clearly not adequate. We need to transition out of capitalism to a post-capitalist, post-growth economy, one that is capable of ensuring good lives for all within planetary boundaries. And to get there, we need to build a political movement that is powerful enough to unseat existing incumbents or otherwise force them to change course. The environmentalist movement cannot do this on its own. To be effective, it must create alliances with unions and working class political formations, which have much more political leverage, including the power of the strike. And for this, it is vital that we foreground the demands for social justice that, I have, that I've highlighted here. Uh, now, yes, of course, such a movement would encounter stiff resistance from those who benefit so prodigiously uh, from the existing arrangement of this economy. But so has every struggle 
for a better world, and that should not deter us. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. Um, Where I sit? Let's keep standing oh, because okay. we need to uh, be sitting all night. Um, so I can imagine you have questions. Um, we have people walking uh, at every stage. Um, so please raise your hand and remember the house rules <laughs> that I pointed out in the beginning. Yes. I have a, a very burning question, it seems. Um, Jason, thanks for the talk. Uh, this is a language for me. Uh, and as a language, I try to uh, find language that... Thanks. Find language that connects and not divides. I try to find language that gets in touch with people and not separate. So if I try to have a conversation with someone from the right that has to get used to the concept of post-growth or degrowth, um, I want to refer to you, uh, and you have a book, and you always use this word. This one word which sets me offside, sets you offside, and the word is capitalism. Why use that word? I don't understand. Okay. This was the language, please. So, thank, you. thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I mean, I, I definitely recognize, and I'm sure all of you do as well, right? It's a strangely triggering word. <laughs> um, but it's also an analytically important word. Like, how do you describe the economy that we're in without, without describing it accurately as capitalism, which it is? Um, and, and I think that, right, it's, it's a bit absurd to imagine that, uh, um, that's, that as we face a crisis that is caused by our economy, we're incapable of describing it correctly. Um, there's these interesting stories about how, uh, like, like right before the collapse of the Soviet Union, right, there was sort of, uh, there was confusion as to why exactly things were not going well, or sort of not denial about it, right? Like, imagine being in that situation and not being able to talk about the structure, the particular kind of economy the Soviet Union had that was leading to this con these contradictions um, uh, during that period. I think we have to be clear about the, the kind of economy we're in and what's wrong with it. And so I find that, I mean, certainly an analytically useful term. Uh, in terms of connecting with people, I mean, you know, look, the policies that we, that we propose are, are actually wildly popular. That's the truth. Like, a huge number of people would have, would have better lives. They would benefit substantially from, uh, from this kind of transition. Uh, we, we see it popular uh, in polls, uh, and I think that's really important. Now, um, uh, now, does that mean that we'll be able to get everybody on board? No. <laughs> Clearly, there are some people who, uh, who, again, have a very strong stake in, uh, in existing structures of capital accumulation, and I think we have to recognize those antagonisms um, and fight for an economy that's, that serves human well-being, serves us and our planet. Um, uh, and and that's, that's what a democratic process is about. Right? We need that. And antagonism is not always bad in that respect. We can't just wish it away. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yes. Perhaps say your name before uh, you... Eva de Bruyne. Um, I really like the broad vision, and I'm uh, wondering what would you recommend to local politicians to do on local level to work towards this uh, vision? <laughs> Important uh, question. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. You know, um, I mean, mo like most of the work in ecological economics has been focused on national economies. Uh, for several reasons, I mean, that's where the, the, the kind of fiscal and monetary power lies, and that's quite important for uh, some of these changes. But at the same time, there are some, there are some cities that are doing amazing work, uh, like, like Zagreb is one, and Barcelona is, is another, where they're actively experimenting with, with some of these ideas, um, and, and have become quite popular in the process, right? Uh, if, you, if you get a chance to visit Barcelona, you'll see what they've been doing with their public transit system and their public bike system. Although, I mean, you can't compare with uh, what you all have here, I suppose. <laughs> so maybe that's a bad example. But um, yeah, I know there's lots of initiatives ha uh, happening at the city level. Uh, and so I would encourage people to, uh, to explore um, yeah, what's been going on in cities like Barcelona. Right. So yeah, the cooperative movement in Barcelona is definitely Yes, that's right. Yeah. Um, yes, go ahead. Yeah. 
Um, hi. Uh, I'm Antonia, I'm from Croatia, so I'm very happy to oh, hear yeah. that Zagreb is uh, doing so well. Um, <laughs> uh, I have a bit of a challenging question, maybe, uh, especially in a room where I feel like a lot of politicians are sitting. Um, uh, of course, this is, oh, uh, uh, you're talking about a democratic system that we have to democratically make a change mm. uh, in, in the course. It has its, its uh, pros and cons, of course. It's very slow. It's a negative uh, part of it. What do you think about a world where there's some kind of dictatorship a way of looking at it to fasten it, maybe from scientists that are data-driven or some ecological uh, climate activists that are <laughs> leading the world? What would that scenario look like? Would that be faster in a, for the transition? <laughs> It's so, it's so interesting you ask that. Um, yeah, this is, this is the sort of thing that jumps to everyone's mind immediately, <laughs> right? So, some kind of like, uh, uh, yeah, interesting fantasy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> look, I think, uh, I think democracy is really important here. But let me describe what I mean. Uh, so, so first of all, we know something quite interesting. Uh, when people have democratic control over production, over resource use and production, then we know empirically that they tend to, to focus on uh, supporting and improving human well-being. They focus production on that objective and also sustain ecology and ecosystems. Uh, and this, and this is, this is a, re a resilient finding, right? When people get together democratically to deliberate about production, that is what they do. So the question is, why does our economy not look like that? And the reason is because our economy is not democratic. Right? And this is interesting. Capitalism is a fundamentally undemocratic economy. Um, yes, it operates in uh, democratic political systems where we elect our elected representatives and so on. But I'll mention what's wrong with that in a second. Um, uh, but the, the system of production is not. Right? Most of us, when we go to work, we work in literally authoritarian <laughs> workplaces where we have no say in how our labor is used and the kinds of things we're producing and the objectives of the, of the company and so on. Right? What would happen if we democratized firms? What if we extend the principle of democracy into the economic realm? That's what I'm calling for here, uh, so that we can deliberate about, about this. There's also the question of citizens' assemblies. Um, official citizens' assemblies have been formed uh, on an experimental basis in, Fra in France and Spain. And they've come up with very interesting ideas, right, like, uh, that align with this kind of vision. They call for post-growth and degrowth policy. Um, and, so and economic democracy, right? Is what you were calling. economic democracy, yes. yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so, and that's and that's very exciting to see. So we know that that uh, under democratic conditions, these ideas emerge very quickly. I mean, people can see what to do. It doesn't take much. Um, but there is a, a very brief thing I should mention about our our actual democratic political system, which is that it's also not a democracy, right? Can we just agree that in a system where media is overwhelmingly corporate controlled? and where corporate lobbyists have an overwhelming influence on policy decisions, that that's not a real democracy? Can we agree on this? And then, <laughs> and, and then for all of us who care about democratic values, right, we need to be insisting on proper democratization of our, of our political system, because right now it is not. And we will continue to face this, uh, the stumbling blocks of that. Right? The problem is anti-democracy. Democracy is the solution. Thanks. Um, so let's go one stage higher. To, oh, fell, fell uh, Yes, I see a good one there. Thank you. Um, Please say your name. Uh, Jupp Eikenown, thank you for your talk, it was amazing. Um, I had a big question. In your, one of your previous slides, you uh, called for the extension of public goods and public services like mm -hmm. affordable housing. That gave me the thought, well, affordable housing, um, should we even own a house in the system you're proposing? Like, is it even ethical to own capital at itself? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> so, so yeah, so I think that, um, so, so we have to distinguish between private property and personal property, right? So, uh, so personal property would be like the things that we use in everyday life that all of us have. Literally all of us have personal property, right? Private property is something quite different, and that's, uh, and that's ownership of the means of production. So, uh, you know, large tracts of land, subsurface minerals, um, you know, factories and, and industrial fishing fleets, that's, uh, that's private property. Um, so I think that's an important distinction. In terms of the question of, of housing, 
Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't, I mean, I saw lots of homeowners, by the way, who stood <laughs> up, so it's not like I'm going to be, no. Um, no, I actually think that, that, uh, that improving access to homeownership is good. The problem is when you own multiple homes and then become a landlord. That is, right, this is a problem. This is when you've, you've, uh, you've uh, produced an artificial scarcity of access to, a, to an important good. And that's, and, that's a, and that's something we have to change, right? So, um, so, uh, so, yeah, so I think that's, that universal access to affordable housing has to be a core value. Um, and I know in the Netherlands that's a major problem right now. Uh, and one that needs to be addressed. Right, so personal property over private property. Um, four after each other, okay. Uh, yeah, pick one. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, I, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, I read your book a while back, and um, I work in the financial sector, so I've been trying to think what should we do, right? Uh. And I only have two small things so far, which is, don't finance anything that's not necessary and make sure your interest rates facilitate like low growth or no growth. Um, is there something else? <laughs> that's really interesting. Yeah, thanks for asking this question. Um, uh, yeah, um, th th that's a good start. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the finance sector is an interesting one, right? Um, I think a lot of people don't understand what finance actually is and does, but it's actually pretty simple. Finance is simply uh, what, what, what mobilizes the productive capacity in our economy, right? Like our labor and our factories and our, and our resources, et cetera. Um, th these get mobilized by finance. And whoever controls finance, right, the big, the big firms that direct finance, they literally get to decide what gets produced. <laughs> uh, and that's, and that's, uh, that's huge power. <laughs> um, and I think that what we need to do ultimately, uh, in addition to the, this important start, is that we need, to, we need to democratize finance in the sense of we need to have more democratic say over how, uh, how uh, our, our collective capacities are mobilized, towards what ends, what we're going to produce, uh, and for what purposes, right? Now, what that looks like, I think, is, is an interesting question. And, and there are PhD students who want to study this right now. And I'm sure you have maybe some insights as well. But, um, but certainly having a, a greater role for public finance, I think, is quite important. Um, which is more accountable to, democratic, to democratically ratified social objectives. Uh, and so that would be one important first step, I think, yeah. So it relates to the top of top topic of economic democracy again, That's right, right. yeah. Yes. yeah. yeah. Um, so perhaps on the third floor, I think there are some people there as well. Um, okay, so we have one standing here, almost, with the question. Let's go over here. Yeah, I think it's quite... We need some collective collectivity here to get, to, get, to get the mic in the middle. <laughs> Thank you. This is called yeah, collaboration, so to right? Collaboration. Yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks, Jason, for your talk. I read your books, also the divide. Uh, we are clearly in a climate emergency. What you're proposing is systemic change. Uh, I sympathize with that, but it will take a long, long time. And I'm not sure it is in line with an emergency. So you can do two things. You can either say, let's change the whole system, and it might work a little bit, but not enough. Or you can say, well, let's work from within the system and try to get the prices right. And I haven't heard you say anything about that because Suppose that you get the prices right and you get, say, proper charges for CO2 of really not 100 euro per ton, but 1,000 euro per ton. You get proper charges for material. What would the picture look like? Because at the end of the day, the, the, the system produces what the people want. It's, it's demand that drives consumption, that drives production. So if the prices are right, is, what would all these charges look like? So is it not a fact that we have this huge market failure, which Pigou talked about, um, which we are basically impossible to um, attack? Good question, yeah. Um, yeah, prices, this is, uh, this is a big one in climate economics, for example. And th there's pretty much unanimous agreement that you would need uh, pretty very high carbon pricing and uh, you know, higher prices on resource extraction, et cetera, et cetera. Um, obviously, that would make a big difference. The question then becomes, 
why is this not occurring? All right? And the answer is this, because again, it has to do with structural features of our economic system that preclude this from occurring. And that is that uh, the objective of capital in maximizing accumulation is to depress the prices of inputs as much as possible and to depress the prices of waste as much as possible, right? Um, and that includes, yeah, wages as well as nature and, uh, and emissions. And so there, there's heavy sort of structural pressure to do that. Um, I mean, the reason we don't have high carbon prices is for the same reason that, there's, that we don't have decent wages, <laughs> right? Because it's, it's incompatible with capital accumulation. So I think that this actually brings us back to the question again, which is that, like, what are the structural features of our economy that preclude this kind of action? Um, and how can we overcome them? Uh, and, um, but there's another, another important issue here uh, to do with pricing, which is that, which is that pricing can often be regressive uh, if it's not managed very carefully. Uh, and we saw this occur in France no? with, uh, um, with Macron's policy, which backfired miserably uh, with strong working class resistance. And he deserved it, right? Uh, I mean, y you can't balance climate policy on the backs of, of poor and working class communities. This is not acceptable. Um, and so, unless there are very strong measures to make sure that this doesn't occur, and that's, uh, and that's exactly what we're trying to get at here with the key social policies that would secure human well-being, um, then pricing becomes problematic. And so I think that we have to watch out for that. Mm. So I'm not against it, but I think that for these considerations, it needs further uh, theorization. Mm. Right. But, but I guess the okay. system change is more difficult then. Yeah, I mean, maybe, but look. Um, I'm not I, sure we have, maybe no, at the... No, no, it's okay, because actually, it, it's, it's something I wanted to address, and so I'm fine to do it. Uh, okay. I, th I think that there are, there are decades when nothing happens, and then there are days when decades happen. And, and I think that we are, we're, we're entering a time when it's clear that people are ready for something different. I think our politics are going to start changing. Um, and, and sure, if we sit back and say, it's not possible for us to achieve a political movement like that, then it won't be. But if we go through the hard work of organizing and building the alliances that are necessary, then we, then we win that, right? There's... <laughs> Thanks. Um, can I have a woman, please? <laughs> it's International Women's Day, for God's sake. <laughs> yeah, I have a woman there. <laughs> yes, yes, go ahead. <laughs> Does it? That, that's no, it's not, not what I meant. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, um, I got past the mic. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Chow is okay. Okay, she's okay with it. All right. Yes. <laughs> so, um, my question relates to something that I think is important, which I've found missing in this story, because it is a lot about. Um, transitioning to a new system, but when we truly understand the conclusion that you clearly gave, that this climate crisis is a colonial crisis, then there comes a moral obligation with it, an ethical obligation with it of repair. Because these 90% of people that you, for instance, described uh, die in the global south for the hoarding of our stuff, these are just not global deaths, it's murder. Understand? If we pollute a river that we know people need to drink from, then that is murder. So what then, after 500 years of systemic institutionalized genocide and ecocide, what do we do to repair that damage and regain our place on the earth as civilized humans? That's it, that's my question. Thank you. <laughs> I thank you very much for this. Yeah. <laughs> and I want to pass the mic for International Women's Day to Cha. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Cha. Um, hi, I was there also yesterday, and um, the only thing I miss in your presentation is indigenous people. I don't see it. So maybe you can add that for your next presentation. <laughs> Here's a tiny remark. <laughs> Th thank you both for representing. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, this is, uh, is, I mean, both are such critically important pieces. Uh, um, in, in my book, Less is More, I, it's, I, I, uh, I invoke several indigenous philosophers who have been extremely important to my thinking. And I, it's, a, it's a great debt, I must say. And I think that's, um, 
that, that we should be reading them. Uh, and, and that's critical because their analysis, uh, of in, at least as far as I've read, is, is actually much more uh, radical and analytically rigorous, I think, than, uh, than much of what passes for environmentalist philosophy in, uh, in mainstream environmentalist discourse. Um, uh, to the question of reparations, I mean, I couldn't agree more. I think that this has to be part of our discussion. Uh, and I think that it needs to be a deep process of healing. I mean, these are, these are, uh, these are wounds that, uh, that fester. And, uh, and um, as, as the anti-colonial philosophers themselves were so careful to say, right, colonialism dehumanizes the colonizer. And I, and I feel that that's important, right? It dehumanizes the colonized, but it also in the process dehumanizes the colonizer. And, uh, and, and we need a process of rehumanization, and it has to come with acknowledgments of the violence that continues to be perpetrated. Um, and, uh, and, and financial operations should be on the table as well. And this may, this may sound uh, like an additional hurdle for people, right? But look, a, tr a, tran a transfer of reparations is very straightforward. It is simply a transfer of purchasing power over the global products, right? From, from one region to the next. Now, the majority of production in our world economy occurs in the global south, from the lands and the peoples and the resources of the global south, even though the majority of the benefits are captured in the rich economies of the global north. And so a, a process of reparations is simply shifting purchasing power um, to the communities of the global south who are producing the goods in the first place. And I think that is like all of us would agree is fair. Mm. Um, and so, and, and so I, sh I think this should be part of our discussion, especially because we, this is a process of international negotiation. Mm. And, uh, and, uh, and so recognizing these justice dimensions is critically important, I think. Thanks. I think we have one, time for one more question. Um, so let's see. Lex, you have one more woman? Yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> yeah, I think the mic is better, but it's, it's coming. Yeah, there we go. Hi, my name is Kanan Dhru. My question is, in a world where the rich countries are descaling and poor and middle-income countries are upscaling, how is it going to coexist from the geopolitical standpoint, in your opinion? Thank mm. you. Thanks. So, um, so what's, what's being called for? Uh, and this is not me. This is, uh, this is a large community of scholars, uh, including in the Global South. Um, is, is, is a kind of new theory of convergence, right? Um, so, right, L let me explain briefly. Um, the existing dominant theory in mainstream economics is that uh, eventually, if given enough time and enough capitalism, that eventually the poor countries will catch up to the, the levels of, uh, of uh, production and consumption in the, or appropriation in the rich countries now, um, converging at the level of the, of the Netherlands and we'll all be happy. Um, but of course, this, is, this has always been a fantasy in the sense that um, in a system that is predicated on net appropriation from the global south, this kind of convergence, this, uh, this catching up kind of development is actually physically impossible to achieve, <laughs> okay? Um, and, so, and so this is a fantasy. Uh, it's a depoliticizing fantasy. Um, what we need instead is a real convergence in the world economy between the north and the south when it comes to energy and material use to a level that is sufficient for meeting human needs at a high standard, Okay, uh, and also compatible with planetary boundaries and sufficiently rapid decarbonization. And the good news is, we know that these, these two objectives uh, can be achieved and are compatible. Uh, and so it is simply a process of the politics of getting there, right? So, this is, so we need a new convergence in the world economy towards this objective. Um, and, th and this, I think, requires like, um, a new kind of political consciousness, one, one that thinks well beyond the nation state. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and starts imagining a global community. And, and I think that, if anything, the ecological crisis forces this realization home, right? Uh, and so I think these are the kinds of directions we need to take. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so uh, I'm afraid we'll, we'll have to move on, or maybe not afraid, because we have uh, some great um, uh, experts joining us now. Um, so please sit down. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, so, yeah, so we'll now what we'll do is, uh, I'll sit down as well, we'll, we'll zoom in 
uh, to three topics um, uh, that were uh, proposed by the panelists I will introduce in a, in a, in a, in a minute. Uh, and so based on these, uh, they, they prepared questions to Professor Hickel. Uh, and so based on these questions, we're gonna, um, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna do the panel. Um, and every question, um, after the question will be asked by the panelists, the, men, the, the, the Mentimeter will show. Uh, and um, you will be able to engage with that question, either ask a follow-up question, question or a remark. And so we'll do, uh, the whole panel discussion will be about 40 minutes, and so we'll, we'll have a bit over 10 minutes for every question. Is that clear? Okay. Um, oh, thanks. <laughs> so, um, so first, um, I would uh, like to ask uh, Ingrid Robijns to the stage. Ingrid is uh, a professor at Utrecht University, where she holds the chair in ethics of institutions at the Ethics Institute. Ingrid works work focuses of, uh, on issues in contemporary political philosophy and applied ethics, like social justice or desirable institutional change. Last year, she, she led a large research project called the Fair Limits Project, which examines the idea of upper limits to how much wealth is, uh, is morally permissible to have. Please um, come and stitch, Ingrid. Thank you. Very relevant, um, very relevant background. So um, I'm pleased, pleased you guys meet uh, today, uh, or actually yesterday. Uh, you already Good spoke to, to each other at the, at the meeting. Um, so, so next on um, is uh, Shibun Jagru. Um, he's an assistant professor at the Institute of Public Administration at the University of Leiden. His current research focuses on human non-human relations in politics and policy mainly in the field of ecology and digital technology. With his research, he seeks to develop policy-relevant perspectives towards more sustainable, democratic, and just futures. <laughs> Good to have you here, too. Um, and finally, we have Hans. He's already on stage. Hans Rodeberg. He's project leader at the Wetenschappelijk Bureau GroenLinks, co-organizer of this evening as well. Uh, so, again, Wetenschap uh, Bureau GroenLinks is the think tank of the Dutch Green Party, or GroenLinks. He currently leads a project exploring possible, possible post-capitalist futures. This will result in a book that is to be published in September called Er is wel een alternatief, routes naar een post-capitalistische samenleving, very relevant, uh, in which a collective of thinkers and activists uh, depict a post-capitalist society, including my colleagues from Commons Network. Um, so, applause for Hans. All right. So, um, so we'll we'll continue. Uh, we'll start over where we we'll, we'll go back. So we'll start with start with Ingrid. Uh, please, Ingrid, could you um, could you could you share with the audience the question that you? I prepared for it. Yes, well, I, I, actually what I, want to, what I prepared has already been said in some sense by members of the audience, but I'll rephrase it to perhaps get it a bit sharper. But I first want to say that uh, Jason Hickel has done really extremely important work to debunk the narrative that capitalism is a win-win for all, and that narrative is still uh, prevalent. His work shows that we are giving people in the global south breadcrumbs from global trade, and that people in the global north are taking the lion's share of uh, the welfare that is generated by globalization. In addition, we are also massively overusing our fair share of greenhouse gas emissions and other material resources. And what I want to do is to look at this from a moral perspective. If we do that, it's clear that we are exploiting the global poor and that we are stealing from their fair share of ecological resources. We are stealing from the people in the global south as well as from future generations, basically from our own children and grandchildren. His argument is that we should reduce the use of energy and material resources in the global north, and that this can be done in a way that leads to better lives for all, except perhaps the 1%. <laughs> My question is about the theory of change in Hickel's narrative. He argues that if people have genuine democratic control, they will want such a degrowth world. We only have to convince them. I have two worries and a suggestion. The first worry is, what if a significant percentage of people 
do not want to live in a degrowth world? What if they choose something else democratically? What if they prefer the capitalist game in which the sky is the limit? My second worry is that in order to meet the climate goals, we have very little time left. Building a social movement that will change the entire economic system will take decades. At least that's what I think. From an ecological perspective, we do not have that time. So what if the goal of reaching a degrowth world in a deeply democratic way takes too much time from an ecological point of view? What if there is a tension between democracy on the one hand and economic and ecological justice on the other hand? Now, I know the book is very hopeful and I don't want to sound too pessimistic, so let me end with a suggestion. I think it's very important that we stress that we have morality on our side and uh, that everyone who is here tonight can go home with a concrete idea that we can contribute something to political and structural change because time is running out. We should have a theory of change in which different groups of people pursue different strategies simultaneously. So yes, there should be a social movement and people with power or prestige have special duties to step up their game. We should be much more aggressively naming and shaming the capitalists who have brought us into this morally unacceptable position. We should also, for example, join shareholder activists. We should use legal instruments. We should also uh, challenge the dominant ideology. And we should use, as far as I'm concerned, any morally acceptable method that helps us to reach ecological justice within the short time frame. And I think, and this is important, we should not do these things because it gives us better lives, but because it is what morality demands. Thank you. Go ahead, Jason. That, that was an excellent <laughs> intervention. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure I have much to respond, really. I mean, I agree. Um, I think that my, yeah, my responses to the question about about political mobilization and, and so on, and democracy, I think I've, I've more or less already, already shared, so I don't, I don't need to repeat that, I guess. Um, although I'd, I'd, be, I'd love to hear from other panelists what they think. <laughs> <laughs> but so you, you don't think there, is a, there can be a tension between democracy and justice? Um, so, yeah. yeah, no, look, I mean, if, if, um, if I was looking at different empirical evidence, then I would have a different feeling about this. But, uh, but I, I actually, I feel heartens. <laughs> Is it good? I don't know. It's a bit distracting, but... This is good. We should just read these. <laughs> more fun. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess I'll just say... Uh, I'll say two things. Um, I think, <laughs> I think perhaps we should, we should have, we thought it would be like distracting for the audience, but we th didn't think it could be distracting for the panelists as well. <laughs> I mean, if they're all laughing, I want to know what they're laughing about. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> okay. So, so I guess I would say two things. First, uh, I'm heartened by the, the, the empirical evidence that we have um, on, on how people do choose to behave under democratic conditions uh, when it comes to decisions about production and in terms of the polling data that I see. Like large majorities want to shift to an economy that is focused on well-being and ecology rather than capital accumulation or growth. Um, and that's pretty clear. And so I think that there's good reason to be hopeful there. When it comes to political movements, I mean, look, I'll say, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. Um, I think that we have difficulty in, our, in these countries, <laughs> our countries in the, in the global north, um, imagining this. Uh, Right, because it's been so long since we have undertaken these struggles. The, 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 the fight for women's suffrage, or even just the labor movements uh, in the late 19th century. Um, these movements changed our countries, right? And that took serious mobilization, and the change was big. Um, and that's the kind of scale that we're thinking about now. But even better yet, think about more recent movements, not here, but elsewhere. Think about the anti-colonial struggle, right? where uh, the poorest, most oppressed people on the planet successfully mobilized to overthrow some of the most violent imperial forces that we've ever known, right? Uh, and never once did they wonder, like, can we do it in time? 
do we have the political mobilization to be able to pull this off, right? You just do it. You have to just do it. Now, does that mean we can definitely finish it in 10 years? Maybe not, but that doesn't mean you stop struggling. Uh, I mean, if we hit 1.5 degrees, do we give up? No, we double down. And, uh, and, so, and so there's the anti-colonial struggle, there's the civil rights movement as well. Um, and, and I think that's a particularly good one, because imagine if you were, <laughs> if you were living in uh, like 1940s USA, and uh, right, you were against racism. Uh, right? It's not enough for you to sit in your apartments and try to not be racist. You clearly have to get out and, and forge alliances and build a movement to overturn a racist system. And I think that that's a very strong analogy to what we face right now, right? A shift from our existing environmentalist discourse of, let me just kind of compost more, mm. right? Yeah. Uh, to let us mobilize. <laughs> and I think that's where we're at right now. So, I mean, but I, but, but I will say, I'm not a political theorist, and I think that <laughs> probably my colleagues here actually have more to say on this, and probably you do as well. So, I cede the floor to you all. <laughs> Let's, let's briefly open up the questions again. I'm a bit, <laughs> a bit doubtful to do it. Um, can we do that? Can we say results are open? <laughs> results aren't hidden. Or is it like there's no way going back now? I think there's no way going back. Okay. Um, that's, that's a pity. <laughs> Okay, let's continue. Um, so, um, yeah, so Shiwun, um, could you please, um, could you please share, share comments and questions? Yeah. Thanks, mic check, mic check. Oh, yeah, Maybe. yeah, that works. Yes, Here we go. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so thanks so much, Jason, for your, for your very uh, important and inspiring talk. Um, so I'll just, uh, my, my question is much shorter, so maybe I have more time to, hmm. to go to the questions and, and to, to deliberate. Um, so we are not equally responsible, we're not all equally responsible for the climate breakdown. You mentioned this also when kind of unpacking the Anthropocene concept. Uh, systems of racial capitalism and systems of nature and labor extractivism, those systems are responsible, right? Um, or to put it differently, not all countries and all human beings have caused the climate crisis. But if we take seriously that colonial legacies and class inequalities, um, uh, uh, if we take those seriously within a degrowth paradigm, or I would phrase it as a, in terms of a decolonial paradigm, um, should energy consumption be regulated differently depending on your class position and depending on your global north or south position, also people uh, with a post-colonial background in the global north? So to put it differently, should, should just the richest people become vegan and only travel by train? And poor households be exempted from this regulation? And if so, what does that mean for the idea of a liberal state or a state that's, uh, that is guided by a rule of law? Um, yeah, it's, these are good questions. Actually, I'd love to hear your perspective. I think, I think again, I mean, uh, I think you all probably have more expertise on these particular issues than I do. But, uh, but, but I'll just mention, uh, I'll briefly mention the research uh, recently done by a colleague of mine, uh, Jill Milward Hopkins, who is extraordinary at this, um, who, uh, who actually asked this very, uh, uh, this very question now. Uh, uh, first of all, we, we, we know how much energy is required to ensure provision of good lives for all, right? We actually can quantify that uh, with bottom-up modeling. We also know how much energy um, uh, is compatible with decarbonization fast enough to stay under the, the Paris Agreement, okay? So this gives us kind of like, a, like a, a floor for energy use, for good lives for all, and then a ceiling for how much we can actually uh, use that's compatible with Paris, okay? Um, so how much room is there for inequality there? This is an interesting question. Right? What's inequality like right now in our economies? Uh, it's extreme, right? Like uh, the richest will, will have uh, hundreds, in some cases in the USA, for example, thousands uh, times more in terms of income than, uh, than, than ordinary working class people. Um, how much room is there for inequality in this kind of uh, climate safe world that I'm discussing? Well, uh, according to Millward Hopkins' research, um, a ratio of about one to six. That's a dramatic reduction in inequality. That's, that's more egalitarian than the most egalitarian uh, of existing European countries, okay? Um, 
Now, what's interesting about this is that, uh, is that, uh, is that it might sound radical at first, but actually it's very much in keeping with what people's preferences are, again, when they have democratic control over this question. Um, when people get to decide what income ratios should be like in the economy, what do you think they gravitate towards? We have empirical evidence on this, too. And it's in the region of about one to three or one to four. People, people want that level of egalitarianism, right? Which, which, again, is compatible with the kind of climate-safe future we're talking about, and wildly different from our existing extraordinary levels of inequality. Um, and so the answer is significant reductions in inequality are necessary. Um, and I think that we need to be talking about, uh, in addition to living wage policies, um, a maximum income ratio of some kinds. I think that's, uh, that becomes apparent uh, in the middle of an ecological crisis that something like that's required. And I think this is probably something you research, and so... Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. And, and maybe just a follow up on that. On that. So, also, I think resonating also with the conversation about uh, reparations, would it would it mean that let's say the Dutch government uh, translates the idea of reparations in terms of a differentiated taxation system or a differentiated approach by regulating different income groups in slightly different ways depending on their carbon footprint or the amount of uh, uh, you know, international travel they, they can, can or cannot go. How would your, I, let's say, degrowth state, how would they, uh, that act uh, and enforce its, its, yeah. its visions? Okay, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's interesting. I think that this is the sort of question that is, is actually um, pretty well answered when it comes to uh, citizens' assemblies and so on, which can mm -hmm. sort of democratically decide how, how certain sectors should be, should be treated. Um, so, but let's take air travel, for example, right? So we know that a pretty significant reduction in air travel is going to be necessary to be compatible with Paris, right? Mm -hmm. The question is, how is that carried out? Like, how can we do that in a just way? If we just use carbon pricing or, tax, or general taxation, then what occurs? Rich people will continue to fly more or less as much as they want yeah. to, whereas yeah. everyone else is cut out, yeah. okay? So this is an extremely unjust, regressive solution. And so something like uh, ensuring that um, that flights are available uh, to those who need it, or let's say uh, one flight every, say, two years or something like that. I mean, clearly there are good reasons to fly uh, sometimes. Um, and then additional flights on top of that uh, are taxed at an increasingly progressive rate, and so it becomes impossible for even the rich to make frequent flights, right? And business class and first class are basically abolished. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, so something like that would be a more just solution. But I think that really this has to be deliberated on kind of a sectoral level. And, I'm, mm -hmm. and so, yeah, it's interesting yeah. to think about. Yeah. Yeah. And if, I'm, if I may just... Um, so we talked about the role of the state, and of course, you know, capitalism needs a state. So the state is capitalist in, 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 in accommodating capital uh, uh, circulation and growth. Um, but how would you, like, what is the role of the state then in the future? Do we need to uh, dismantle the state as well, as well as dismantling capital, capitalism? Because you might as well end up with a very modernist Western idea of uh, political institutions like the nation state or the state as a form of political power. So would you um, say we still need to operate within the, con the con contours of a, of a state system? Or would that be a short-term solution only to gain power and to uh, kind of shape the transition? Mm. Uh, I feel like my Two anarchist minutes. credentials are... <laughs> yeah, Two minute, three minutes now. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I'm not going to have time to give what my full answer would be to this, since it would be quite complex. But, but let me just briefly say, yeah, I think that um, uh, states can be different kinds of animals. And our existing state, as you pointed out, is a, is a kind of animal that, that, uh, that services the interests of capital accumulation overwhelmingly. Now, we've found ways to tame it a little bit, so we get a little bit of public service here and there, et cetera, but, mm -hmm. um, but it's a more or less minor feature of the way we consider the production, the production system. Um, and I think that that can be pretty significantly changed. Uh, we can have, we can have a, a state that is more focused on social and ecological objectives and is more democratic and can serve uh, can serve our purposes uh, rather than those of, uh, of a, uh, a relatively small segment of our, um, of our economy. Mm -hmm. yeah. so. Thanks. Yeah. I think you solved it, so... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, two questions. <laughs> Thank you. Um, can we go up? Is that, is that possible? Also, no, no way to come back anymore. Okay. It's a very rigid <laughs> mentimeter. Um, okay. Uh, I think... There's one question on behaviorism. Let me see. Doing it ethical. Almost. Ooh. 
Yes. Yeah, I'm not sure if it can all go up. Okay, Technology. so understand the foundations <laughs> of our behavior, look, looking at historical, uh, historic development and philosophy. That's, that's a know, statement. That's a statement. I think that's, that's a statement. I think that's chat GB, GPT, GPT. I actually, I actually so, like, I like the one in the bottom left better, which is the just... The left one. Which is just question a question mark. mark. <laughs> this is like, totally question mark. What are you talking about? <laughs> you don't understand I'm anything. I'm flabbergasted. <laughs> <laughs> what is um, happening? So maybe the question on ethical, doing the ethical thing is dependent on your perceived system boundaries. How can this influence politics in a just way? We need a cultural shift first. I don't know if, Ingrid, maybe you want to, you don't, well. Hmm. But I think in, uh, polit po uh, institutional shifts, politi policy shifts, and cultural and ideological shifts, they all have to go together. Yes. So I don't think it's uh, a choice. And I, I think given the urgency, everything needs to be done hmm. uh, as, as quickly as possible. <laughs> okay, so the urgency is clear for you. Yeah. Um, all right, Hans, uh, I yes. think we can Can you hear me? Uh, if you hold it like this, yeah? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, <laughs> so you hear everything I said. Yes. Oh. <laughs> um, now I have a question on the job guarantee, um, because uh, it's a proposal I'm, uh, I'm a big fan of, so I, um, uh, I really support it. Um, and there's two reasons. Uh, the first is um, that I really believe in this policy proposal because we have in the Netherlands still, people often tend to forget this, hundreds of thousands of people um, who are uh, willing to work but just can't find a job. Uh, yeah. We say in the Netherlands the, they have a distance to the labor market, but in fact the labor market has a distance to them. Um, so I really think this could be a problem solver in that aspect. Um, I also want to talk about this proposal because it isn't often discussed in the Netherlands, job guarantee. And one of the reasons is that we have a very tight labor market, uh, so there are, are shortages everywhere. So it, it feels illogical for a lot of people to now implement a job guarantee. Um, so I just wanted to ask you about the specifics of the job guarantee, like um, how universal should it be? Can everyone just quit their job and apply for a job guarantee? Um, what should the wages be? Uh, how, how high should the wages be? I mean, a lot of people, um, especially in, in the so-called bullshit jobs, people who say their own job is pretty useless, is about one in five in the Netherlands. Um, <laughs> but they, they, they do get... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, like... <laughs> it's rambling on the stage. Uh. <laughs> um, but those often are really well-paid jobs, like financial mm -hmm. management, communications uh, officer, uh, those kind of jobs. Like, how are, gonna, how are we going to make it? Some communication some, officers some people, Oh, shit. <laughs> How are we going to make the, uh, the job guarantee, those really useful jobs, attractive, attractive enough for the people with the bullshit jobs? And um, so th those are my two questions, I think. Hmm. Yeah, let's keep yeah. it at that. Yeah, I, I mean, I love talking about the job guarantee. I think it's such an exciting proposal. <laughs> um, because, uh, because, look, it can be quite powerful at doing several things at once. Um, uh, so for one, um, it can be used to set labor standards in the whole economy, right? Which, is, which can be very difficult to do uh, um, just through regular le uh, legislation. But if, if you have a job guarantee uh, system that does three things, let's just say, for the sake of argument, that pays living wages, right? Like real living wages, um, that has a shorter working week, let's say 30, 32 hours, okay? And that um, has a democratized workplace, okay? So think about these three things. Immediately, you can see that people will be attracted to that. They would rather do socially necessary use value labor um, for a dignified living wage under democratic conditions where they can feel ownership over production, right? Than they would uh, doing bullshit jobs or, uh, or like um, working for whatever, uh, McDonald's or Zara uh, to mostly service corporate profits, right? And so there would be, quite, I think, high demand for this, and it would sh I think it would shift our productive capacities towards uh, more socially necessary use value forms of production. Um, and you can see very quickly that the rest of the economy would be forced to follow suit <laughs> pretty fast. 
um, they would be forced to raise their wages to the living wage standard. They'd be forced to introduce democratic reforms in the workplace. And they'd be forced to reduce their working hours uh, in order to compete for labor that they're losing, right? And that would very quickly change labor practices in the economy. I think, I think for these reasons, it's very powerful. Um, in addition to the obvious fact that you abolish the artificial scarcity of unemployment, which no economy needs to have. Um, it is a fiction. Uh, unemployment, involuntary unemployment, is a literal fiction that does not need to exist. And this idea that we're, we're constantly sold by politicians and by uh, orthodox economists that growth will solve this problem, it never does, right? It never does. We've had generations of growth and still the unemployment rate is at structural levels to maintain low wages. It's, the, it's purposeful. Uh, so, so we can abolish that with policy, and I think this is where it really comes in. But the specifics of it, I mean, I think that it needs, it needs a lot more experimentation, a lot more, uh, a lot more thought, and I think that we should try it and see where it goes, right? Uh, and I think it, it'll look different in different contexts precisely because it is democratic. Uh, so we see. Thanks. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, do we, can we open up, or is that, there's no questions now? Okay, we, 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 we stopped the whole Menti oh. thing. <laughs> we have to go. I do I think. I, I, I have one follow-up question, and I guess the, the whole section is flooded with this question. How, yes. how about basic income? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's interesting. <laughs> because you, um, really, you really put a big emphasis on work. Why is work so important? Why is not people, uh, giving people an income and let them take care of themselves when it comes to work Yeah, a good solution. Yeah, I, um, I'm not against basic income, actually. Uh, and I think that the two should be implemented together I I in some way, right? Now, the one problem that basic income has is that because it, like, it seems to emerge from, the, from, uh, from a culture that is mo mostly understands itself as consumers um, and does not think much about the production system. And so therefore, uh, it's like, let's have money in so we can, we can, uh, we can consume, no? but, which is fine, and we'll exp we'll, I'll talk about that in a second, but, but we also need to think about production, what is happening with production, what we're producing, why, and who benefits, and so on. I think that the job guarantee actually focuses the mind on this. Like, how do we want to use our collective capacities? Um, what kinds of things do we want to produce in the first place? Um, or not. Uh, and so, but, but I do think that basic income has an important role um, and that is for people who, um, who, uh, who choose not to work for whatever reason, who, like who don't want to do the kinds of jobs that are available under a job guarantee uh, program, um, and want to focus their efforts on something else that is not covered by that program. And by the way, I think the program should be broad in the sense of care is an important contribution to our well-being. And that should be something that we consider under the job guarantee, right? But there may be things even beyond that that we can't think of that people want to be, be engaged with that's important for themselves and their families and their communities. So you in include um, informal care as well, right? Uh, at, at the household. Yes, and I yes. think that basic income could, could be crucial to, uh, to, to ensuring that this is also an option. So I, I don't see them as mutually exclusive. And it's, inter it's interesting to see that whenever I mention the job guarantee, basic incomers are like, boo! And then if I mention basic income, the job guarantee is like, boo! <laughs> and I'm like, let's, we, we can synthesize. <laughs> so, we don't need to pick. Yeah. Um, okay, oh, so we can see it now. Um, talk about civil disobedience. Okay, so we have XR coming up Saturday. Oh, I'm sure you'll all be there. Oh, we have, oh, great. We have that for climate over there. Thank you for coming. Um, talk about civil disobedience. Um, so, yeah, Jason, could you, you, you talked about uh, social movements, the role of social movements, of, of, of political mobilizing, of the, of the fact that we, this is not, uh, the transition is not going to like, come easily from those in power uh, who, who currently benefit so, so much from the status quo. Could you, could you speak to the role of civil disobedience, perhaps? Mm. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's, it's very clearly critically important. Um, and we can't, uh, we can't uh, overstate that fact. Um, uh, now, um, again, I'm no political strategist, but I'm going to make two suggestions. And, uh, and, and I'm, I'm happy to be overridden, actually, on this, so let's see. But, um, we'll have two uh, politics, politi uh, politicians going on stage. Oh, good. <laughs> so that's okay. But the first is I think that's, um, I think that's uh, and I mentioned this briefly in my talk, that's, uh, it's, it's going to be imperative that environmentalists build strong alliances with labor unions and, and working class political formations. Because 
while, environment, while, while the environmentalist movement at XR and Fridays for Future, et cetera, have done an excellent job at, bringing, at changing the public discourse, which has been huge, and thank you uh, for your hard work and dedication. Um, uh, and, and, and we're able to block bridges in central London, et cetera, and that can be quite effective, um, for instance. But, but nothing compares to the power of the strike. And until we build alliances with the communities that, uh, that, um, that wield that power, uh, then I think we lose. And I say this as a, as a longtime member of the labor movement. This is like, like I'm pleading with you. These, these alliances must be built. Um, and this, this also re re requires, for, for those of you who are trade union members, by the way, this requires a shift in the mentality of the labor unions. Because, because so far, we've had, we're in the situation where we've aligned ourselves with capital in believing that growth is somehow magically going to solve the question of wages and employment and livelihoods, and it never does, right? We've, like, we've bought this weird ideological line. Let's go back to our original demands, right? Solve the question of livelihoods and employment permanently now. And uh, so we want the, the job guarantee, we want universal public services, we want economic democracy. These are the original demands of the labor movement, and how did we betray them? Uh, so we go there, and we, al we align with the environmentalist movements um, uh, uh, around these common objectives, right? Uh, an eco-social transition that achieves both aims uh, is critical, and I think this is where we win. Um, and the second brief thing I'll say about civil disobedience is that to the extent that this is about disruption, um, I think that we need to be uh, as smart as possible about what we're disrupting. Um, and, uh, and that means disrupting capital accumulation. Um, right? And I think that there have been some pretty smart actions uh, in some cases, uh, but, but more thought can be put into this. And I think that here, uh, labor union uh, strategies can be very uh, informative. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you. Can we see Hans, members of labor unions? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> if you're not, then you should join. <laughs> um, okay, so I think we need to move on. Um, thank you so much for being here with us uh, and joining the conversation. All three. Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thanks, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so, for the final part for tonight, um, we have uh, two, um, two politicians coming up. First, we have uh, Susanne Kreuger. Susanne is a member of the House of Representatives for the Greens, for GroenLinks. She previous, previously worked for Greenpeace, where she contributed to campaigns on global trade, combating deforestation Hello. and climate change. And fun fact, she also was the one um, inviting Jason to Parliament today. Thank you so much. So, so uh, we're very happy to have you here. Then we have Rutger Groot-Wassink. Rutger Groot-Wassink is Deputy Mayor of Amsterdam. He's also Alderman. Uh, and in this position, he holds the portfolios Social Affairs, Diversity and Democratization. Before that, he acted as the Group Chairman of GroenLinks in the Amsterdam City Council. Thanks for being here as well with us. Rutger. All right, um, so uh, I have many questions <laughs> for you, but we only have uh, 20 minutes. Um, so, so perhaps uh, it would be great if you, if, you, if you would give a first reflection on the, on, on the, on the, on the degrowth narrative, on the story of, of Jason. Um, uh, so perhaps, uh, Suzanne, if you could go first. Yeah, maybe yes. I can share something about the session we had today in Parliament, because yeah. I think that was really interesting. Um, we invited uh, both uh, Jason Hickel and also Barbara Baarsma, who wrote a book about green growth. Uh, and there were eight parties there. So all parties, bigger parties uh, uh, in the Parliament were there. And I think what was interesting is that you see that it's, it's the shift that we're now discussing and the shift we need to see towards a just economy, uh, towards a discussion about that fighting climate change has to be a fight for climate justice, that that no longer is a niche topic. So it's a broader topic that a lot of parties are, are struggling with. Um, and I think also the fact that that sort of economic growth is the holy grail um, and, and what a beyond growth 
scenario or, or uh, society would look like. I think there were a lot of elements in the discussion we had in Parliament today that, that you could transform quite directly to political action. Yeah. And where I could also see that like, there would be different parties or that you know, I could work with uh, to achieve that. Hmm. So I think that was really interesting for me, um, yeah, that your book uh, could quite easily, or not easily, <laughs> that, that's maybe too, uh, <laughs> too optimistic, <laughs> uh, but that there were a lot of leads there, that a, a lot of, uh, how do you say, that, that caught a lot of interest, I think, uh, also in the questions you got from other parliamentarians. Hmm. So, yeah, for me that was a really, uh, uh, yeah, great achievement achievement of today that we had this debate in Parliament and that we're really start starting to set that mind shift and moving away from yeah, this focus on economic growth that so much of our politics still have. Yes. Yeah, so because we had uh, CDA, VVD, Christian Union, PVDD, GroenLinks uh, and Volt, uh, I think, joining today, right? So it was very broad in terms of political spectrum. Um, Rutger, could you please... Uh, well, well, let me first of all uh, uh, thank you very much for being here and having this uh, fantastic talk. And it, I think uh, it was a thought-provoking and very inspiring presentation that you gave. And uh, um, uh, I haven't finished your book, I have to be honest. <laughs> it's <okay>. um, <laughs> but, but it's it's it's, it's thought-provoking, okay. and I think it, it it takes way too much time to reflect on that. But uh, what I find very interesting is, and I think that one of the former speakers also mentioned it. I think that you uh, said. This, 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 is all, this means something, uh, um, uh, it, it kind of rede redefines uh, our, our, our state, our nation state. And uh, uh, if, if you talk about uh, uh, substructure and superstructure, uh, the economy <laughs> as substructure definitely defines our superstructure. Yeah. And what does it mean? And if we talk about public service and if we talk about restructuring our economy, what does ownership mean and who owns the means of productions? And this is all kinds of, 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 of next level steps that, 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 that I think that we can fill a, a series of evenings with, but I found it very interesting. But uh, of course, as a local politician, um, um, I also find it very inspiring. And I think that what, 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 what your talk and, and today's subject does is in, in, in a way it, it, it it reframes the narrative, uh, and I think that, it, from my perspective, as, as being uh, being active in in in, our, in 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 Amsterdam, uh, uh, what what we try to do is to build local practices and to build uh, local um, 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 experiments. And, and the, yeah, ex maybe experiments, but. It's more than that. I think that in a sense we are also trying to change the narrative by, for example, using the donut economy. But in, in a sense is what we try to do is to hammer wedges in the dam. Um, yeah. and, and I think that your book is a huge wedge uh, in the political discussion. So thank you for that. Okay. So on the topic of, you, you speak about, um, so you spoke about, um, collective ownership over the means of production, the idea of economic democracy. Um, it relates a lot to this idea of, 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 um, um, of co-ops, right? Of cooperatives and, the, and, and uh, promoting the cooperative movement in Amsterdam, which is very much also part of the, of the donut idea, the commons, right? That Amsterdam embraced. Um, so do you feel that this is also something that Amsterdam uh, is, it, it could take a leading role in, uh, in really promoting and expanding that, that space in the economy, the, 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 the collective uh, community economy, you could call it, right? Um, for example, we saw that the, the housing co-op in Amsterdam, Amsterdam uh, not so recently ago, they didn't, uh, they didn't make it. Um, and so there's a clearly, of course, there's a role of the public, uh, of the, there's, a, there's a role of the local government there, isn't there? To, isn't it to, to yeah, 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 definitely. To promote. I'm, 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 um, um, it, it would be quite arrogant to say that Amsterdam should be or, or could be uh, even leading in that. But yes. I think that what we are trying to do is that we are trying to work, uh, for example, with the Commons Network uh, to see what kind of co-ops there are possible. And in a sense, uh, we are very inspired by, for example, community well building and the Cleveland model. Yes. Uh, and we are now investigating worker co-ops, uh, which can be very interesting. Yeah. But the, I have to say, they're, they're, they will, by definition, will be very local. Because uh, when you look at 
uh, uh, procurement, there are all kind of national regulations and all kind of national boundaries that, that really tighten us. Uh, yeah. So what we can do is build practices uh, and, and experiment with co-ops, uh, but still, uh, yes, we can, um, we, we can be um, happy evangelists of the uh, commons uh, uh, um, message, but it's quite, it's quite complicated. We're definitely going to need uh, national uh, legislation yes. uh, to make it way, way, way easier. Right. Yeah, right. And that's also something... <laughs> okay, so well, thanks. if, if, if uh, let's be democratic, if everybody agrees on that, we'll all go to the bar. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have some. I um, I'm not here to promote. Pro, I think we're not not all of not, none of us is here to only promote uh, the Greens. I guess to have a critical discussion about green politics. So, um, so let's continue doing that. I'm not <laughs> running in an election. <laughs> can I can I just say one thing about uh, the cooperative uh, movement? Because I think that's one of the, the questions I had with the book uh, also, because it's quite a lot about uh, the relationship between state and, and corporates, right? But why, how big is collective ownership uh, versus uh, national or state ownership? And I think that's one of the debates we're having currently on the, our energy system. Yeah. I think given the energy crisis, there's been a lot of debate on how hey, we have now an energy system that we have so little control over, actually. Um, so one of the things we've been really pushing in Parliament is much more the uh, cooperative uh, energy uh, cooperatives uh, and the opportunities for people to, uh, to produce their own energy, either on a, on a, on a local level or share energy. Um, but so, so I, yeah, if I can also ask a question. But yeah, <laughs> no, you well, can. Well, is, is how, how you would see collective ownership as part of your narrative um, and vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, state company ownership of, for example, energy yeah. companies? Yeah, no, I think that's, um, I mean, I live in Barcelona and co-ops are all over the place in Barcelona. Yeah. And this was amazing when I first moved there. Uh, like my energy is supplied by a co-op uh, in, in my flat, right? And, uh, and uh, my internet is supplied by co-op, and um, I don't own a car, but uh, I have access to a, an electric car co-op where we share electric cars. And, and all of these are democratically run, right? Like I'm a, I'm a member, and so you get to go and you get to make, like, help make decisions about how the company should run, and this is amazing. Um, and I think as a result, it's, I mean, it's extremely popular in Barcelona, and people want to be part of these, they want to be provisioned by these. And I think that certainly in the absence of, um, of effective public utilities. Like, in Barcelona, a lot of, there are not good public options for, uh, for things like internet, for example. Which, I mean, can we agree? This should clearly be a public utility available to all for free. Um, it's sort of obvious to me. But in the absence of that, I think that, uh, that's, um, that the, the, the co-ops are incredible and, uh, and, and really demonstrate quite a lot about what, uh, what uh, democratic cooperative ownership can achieve. <laughs> Uh, I mean, right? It's, uh, it's quite impressive. There's, there's almost nothing that they can't do that uh, existing private firms can. And that's, um, and, uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, I mean, when it comes to this, to key provisioning like this, right? And that's, uh, and that's quite, yeah. that's quite but, interesting. But, but I think that, that uh, uh, I, I have some, uh, I have quite some context in, in, in Barcelona, and I know that, uh, that, that Catalonia has way more uh, uh, possibilities to do that than the Dutch nation state gives a municipality mm. as Amsterdam, for example. Because yeah, I know that enough, uh, enough, in Barcelona there had been a huge fight over the, the control of water uh, uh, yeah. a couple of years ago. And in the Netherlands this is very state dominated, uh, which makes it quite impossible for us. But I, I'm, mm. I'm very happy with a lot of examples from Barcelona and they're a huge inspiration for us. Yeah, but, but I should also add, right, like, like clearly, um, Clearly, some utilities must be run by the state because they're monopolies. Okay, so like the water system, uh, the uh, the electricity system, the electricity system. These these are these are uh, um, are, are natural monopolies, and they should be publicly owned and controlled. Right. Uh, and I think that's quite. 
Yeah, they're not. They're not in the no, Netherlands. Exactly. So th which that is was, wild. That was my point. <laughs> I wanted to link to the, uh, to the to the topic of decommodification, right? Because in your book, you 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 explicitly say uh, the um, you mentioned the importance of universal basic services going hand in hand with decom decommodifying certain uh, crucial. Uh, um, public sectors um, and with expanding the commons, right? It's not uh, one or the other. So how would that decommodification co process look like? Um, would, you, would you like, would you say we, we, we nationalize uh, certain sectors? And so how would that, are we gonna expropriate Shell? Or how is that, uh, how, is it look, how does it look like? Yeah, we had a discussion about this earlier, I think, yeah. <laughs> about the shell question. Because I, I think the big challenge with that one for me would be um, what are the benefits of doing that over really strong legislation and norms yeah. of... Because of, I think it's clear we have to break down fossil industry and we have to... They have to diminish, or how do you say it? They have to... Well, what's the scale word? Out, down, uh, scale out. Yeah. <laughs> down, um, <laughs> don't know the word, um, and, and I mean, I think that's the interesting bit that we now see in the Dutch context of uh, our climate policies, is that we uh, have a lot of debate about green industrial politics, yeah. and we have a huge fund right now, a big climate fund to, to help transition companies from A to B, but what you see happening is that we basically take the whole old fossil sector and we pay them to get clean. Yeah. Uh, which is, of course, uh, not, not asking the question, well, it's not asking the question, what is the industry and what are the sectors that we yeah. need in a future economic system that's clean, that's within the planetary boundaries, that just. Um, but I don't know if, if, if well, I, I think that nationalizing uh, certain fossil companies uh, takes a lot of public money, uh, and and you could uh, better solve it by well by setting norms and standards, and and basically uh, uh, yeah breaking so, down that fossil system. But we don't need, we don't need to compensate them, right? Not always. Do we need to compensate Shell? Well, <laughs> well, I think well that's I think from the audience there's also I mean I think one of the key things that we should be doing is really getting rid of fossil subsidies because at the moment we have, well, <laughs> we, have, we have a system, uh, we have an economic system that's still driven by fossil subsidies on the one hand and then we use our sustainability subsidies to pay the same companies that will still get fossil subsidies to yeah. move towards green. Of course. Which is, yeah, a really weird way. So the question will be, is that enough, right? If we get rid of, of fossil subsidies only. Um, <laughs> Jason, would you like to, would you like to comment? Yeah, uh, um, although I, everyone's got a good opinion about this, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's pretty clear that we have to bring not only the fossil fuel companies, but also the energy companies into public ownership and control. Yeah. Um, and the reason is because we need to be able to uh, cap and scale down fossil fuel production uh, and use um, on a scientifically informed timeline and do that in a just way that ensures people have access to the energy resources they need, right? Do we trust the, the, the fossil fuel companies to do this? I think it's quite clear that we cannot, right? And they do everything in, in their power to evade <laughs> Uh, legislation, and, and, and we're effectively, like, we're fighting an incredibly big beast. I mean, they have extraordinary power over, um, over media disinformation, over our political process. Why would we put ourselves in a position where we have to fight that? Take them under public control, and that way we don't have to fight that battle. We can do what we know is necessary socially and ecologically with our fossil fuel resources and with our energy uh, distribution. Right? To me, to me this, is, this is a no-brainer, and we have to start talking about this. Um, and I think this is part of a democratic process for, uh, for us. Hmm. Yeah. Do you think... Yeah. <laughs> you, Rutger, you think GroenLinks is ready to do that? No, well, no I strongly agree. Uh, <laughs> and also from a more practical point of view, uh, I'm an alderman of social affairs, and if I want to make a... Uh, uh, this, this job guarantee. Uh, uh, I've tried to work on job guarantees, but 
uh, as long as I have to work with uh, commercial employers, I'm not going to get a, a, a job guarantee like, like you were talking about. And I think that public control of several uh, public functions uh, and democratic control of several functions is, is crucial uh, if you want to make a change. Uh, and it's not only the uh, economical change, but also the change in the labor market and the change in the perspective that people have on their way of life. And I think that what, what you were saying, um, this isn't only, this is, uh, the, 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 the transition must be a just transition where a lot of people benefit from who are now uh, uh, in, in precarious functions and, 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 and jobs. So, uh, even from a, from a job perspective, from, from a, a social, uh, social benefit perspective, uh, we definitely need democratic ownership of, of a lot of public function in our society. Yeah. I was going to add one thing about, um, uh, I think, one of the messages that uh, also today in Parliament quite resonated is, is the whole issue of strengthening the public sector. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think one of the, um, the examples that came up, I believe, in the discussion was about mobility and uh, public transport. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of our policy currently are, is so much focused on basically saying, okay, we, we continue the system as we have, uh, and we're just going to move everybody to an electric car. And meanwhile, everything stays the same. And this whole idea of actually moving towards much better you know, public uh, transport, uh, uh, sharing cars, uh, being that in a cooperative way, this is, that's the system change that would actually get you to, uh, yeah, an economic system between your, uh, within your boundaries. And I think the whole idea of really, uh, as one of the, how do you say, the pillars of a, of a just transition, strengthening your public uh, sector while even, and setting the, the, what do you call that? The, um, the ecological, the, the normation, the norms for your, the companies that you do have yeah. is, is a critical part of, and I do think that that was a part that also, um, there was quite a lot of interest in. Didn't you feel? Mm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this I'm morning. testing here the political uh, <laughs> momentum. Yeah. So, so in general, you would say that the Greens or GroenLinks would be ready to, to take the degrowth, perhaps not the label, but the content of the degrowth agenda forward as, like a, uh, as a political program, as a political vision uh, for the future. Well, I would say that, that the idea that you, you create an eco economy that's not based on a push, a focus on growth, and that your focus is, like you said, creating welfare within the planetary boundaries, that that's a mission, uh, and that that has a lot of, I mean, it has so many practical steps that we can take. Yeah. And I think that's the really interesting part also in the previous session, but also what you were saying, Rutger, about all the ways in which you can actually, well, I, I use the word experiment, but uh, the ways you can actually make it practical in yeah. your... In your uh, Tangible already yeah. now, today, in the current system. Well, and maybe to add something, I think that, that in, in a sense, uh, um, uh, the things that Jason has been saying, uh, they, 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 they resonate some of the basics of, of, of GroenLinks ideology, yeah? that, that economic growth isn't the crucial thing, but I think that it, it, when it's combined with decolonization uh, and the international solidarity that has always been uh, key uh, in, in our thinking and gives it a way more practical uh, uh, focus, I think that's, that's, that's definitely an agenda that we should be working on. Um, so. I, I think that, 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 that um, I'm very looking forward to the book Hans is making, and I hope that, uh, that the thinking of, 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 of Jason will be a, a, a central part of that. I'm sure it will. Um, so uh, I think we need to wrap up. I already see some people moving, and um, we start a bit later, um, so we'll end up uh, a bit later now, but I think um, we're past 10 o'clock. Um, so, Jason, thank you so much. Um, you. I perhaps I wanted to ask a final question. What you've been here for two and a half days now, almost mm -hmm. three, um, and you saw quite a bit of the Netherlands, the political context. We talked this morning about the sixth of crisis, the nitrogen crisis. We talked all about all these different aspects. Uh, we were in Amsterdam South this morning. I was telling you about the taxes. <laughs> um, so. 
Um, what is your hope for the Netherlands? <laughs> no, we need to go through South to go to The Hague. Bedankt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, does someone say revolution? Uh, um, yeah, no, I've really enjoyed my time and I have to say that this evening has been my favorite part, uh, <laughs> engaging, engaging with you all, because I really sense, I mean, it's interesting, uh, I really sense an energy. And, um, and, uh, and, and something is happening, and that's, that's exciting for me, and I, I'm curious to see where things go. But I hope that we can collaborate uh, in the future and, uh, and, uh, and unite movements and, uh, and, see, and see where this takes us. So thank you for having me. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and uh, there will be a bar outside. Uh, there's a book uh, stand uh, where the Dutch translation of, of Jason's book will be sold. So please, if you have, don't, haven't read it yet, uh, you can buy it over there. Um, thanks again for coming. <laughs> <laughs>